Hello, everyone. My name is Lane Wimberly. I'm one of the orthopedic surgeons at Scottish Rite. Uh, Dr. Morris and the team here have asked me to discuss cerebral palsy with you guys. I am one of the uh, orthopedic surgeons, and my real interest is in neuromuscular care of the lower extremities specifically. And part of that also has me as the medical director of Movement Science Laboratory, so I'm involved in the clinical interpretation of the gait studies that we get here. We do have a mission statement for cerebral palsy, and effectively, we want to provide excellent medical and surgical care for children with cerebral palsy through an interdisciplinary approach with evaluation, treatment, and support of the families throughout the childhood. We use evidence-based interventions as much as we can, and we really focus a lot on neuromuscular scoliosis, hip subluxation, foot and ankle deformities, and we have an upper extremity team that will help with hand and uh, upper extremity difficulties. So the original cerebral palsy clinic here was established in 2016, almost five years ago now. Uh, some of you may remember when these children were not routinely seen at Scottish Rite. Luckily, now we're able to see almost all of them without any difficulty. And currently, the clinic is running about one and a half full days a week of just patients with cerebral palsy that I'm seeing. Uh, I do have some of my colleagues certainly do see kids with cerebral palsy as well and provide excellent care. Um, and in my clinics, they're uh, able to see me and oftentimes orthodox physical therapists, our physical medicine doctor, if necessary. And we always have neurology and developmental pediatrics just down the street if we need them, or just down the hall, excuse me. <laughs> the top left picture is Fabiola Reyes, who is a physical medicine rehabilitation physician that works with me. She has been really incredible in improving the perioperative care of these children. Uh, with regard to the rehabilitation potential. And in addition, she takes care of many children who never have surgery with tone management or with equipment needs. Dr. Adams is our lead developmental pediatrician and really helps with perioperative care of these medically complicated children. And the bottom left is Michelle Christie, who's one of the neurologists that helps a lot with overall care of these children as well. We do have a movement science laboratory, as many of you know. We actually have two, one in Dallas and one at North Campus in Frisco. And this allows us to have an objective assessment of a child when they walk. And it doesn't matter whether they use assistive devices or not. We can still harvest very objective information about their hips, knees, ankles, trunk, and use that to follow them longitudinally. So is their crouch really getting worse, or is it just something that we perceive by watching them walk down the hallway? Uh, we can also use this information to compare outcomes surgically. So did we achieve the result that we were hoping to with our interventions? When treating kids with CP, we like to have realistic uh, goals and expectations, and we really want the family and the patient to know what those may be. They have to be aware for lots of these children, their prolonged recoveries. It may be six or 12 months before they've ultimately recovered their strength and functional ability to where they were preoperatively. And many of these kids will need changes in their equipment. So if you do a spine surgery, almost certainly their seating system will have to change after they've recovered from this, and the family needs to be aware of these expected changes. We do employ mutual decision-making, so patients, parents, surgeons, and the multidisciplinary team are really involved in making decisions about the appropriate care, especially surgically. Sometimes it just doesn't make sense to offer a surgery, and sometimes the family and the patient may opt out of it depending upon their risk and benefits. Unlike cancer surgery or heart surgery, these are most of the time elective cases, and we really try to work with the family about the timing. So if someone has a vacation in March, we really don't want to do a big surgery in February. We just say, do it in the summer. Don't worry. Enjoy your vacation, and we'll take care of the kids at the appropriate time. We obtain informed consent from caregivers, from parents, and from the patient as much as possible. Sometimes kids don't have the ability to participate in decision-making, but we try and involve them as much as possible. And many of these kids are medically complex and have a higher risk of medical comorbidities that may increase their surgical complications. And it may be their complication is a pneumonia or difficulty resuming their feedings uh, that they're used to. And these can be acute or they can come long term. And we try and follow these to make sure that kids are getting the best care possible. And unfortunately, no matter how much we plan and how much we discuss and how technically competent we try and be, sometimes outcomes are not what we expect. And the family has to understand that that can sometimes happen and we try and help them with coping strategies if the outcome is not what was expected. And then finally, you'll hear me talk about it a few times here, occasionally you have to have surgery at age four just for to improve your functional ability or your bracing or whatever it might be. 
And in a four-year-old, we know they have 10 to 12 more years of growth remaining. So it's very predictable that that child may need additional surgeries as they grow. Some of these we can plan for and some we can't. So we always let families know that possible further interventions may be necessary. GMFCS is called is a classification systems, gross motor function classification system. And it really helps us guide treatment and expectations. It's, uh, children are classified one to five, depending upon their functional level. A level one child is probably out playing soccer with all the typically developing kids with just a small difference that may be relatively subtle. And a GMFCS5 child is in a wheelchair and requires assistance throughout all of their activities of daily living. There may be some subtle changes in level as children grow and age, and the definition of the level may subtly change. But it's very hard for a child to change one level, and certainly almost never two levels. So if you're a GMFCS3 at age six, you'll probably be a GMFCS3 at age 15, although your, your equipment needs may vary just a little bit. Families often want to know what the ambulatory or functional potential is for children, and I never give them the perfect definitive answer, but in general, it does appear that most kids will achieve their optimum or nearly their optimum functional level by the age of about five or six, and that is regardless of what their functional level may be. It seems to be that the highly involved children may reach their maximum a little bit earlier than those children who are going to be running around independently. But by the age of five or six or so, we have a pretty good idea of what their independent ambulatory status or functional ability may be. Unfortunately, the children who have lesser functional abilities oftentimes have a little bit of a decline in their functional ability with aging. And this may be uh, predictable. Uh, it's effectively a child gets heavier and the inherent weakness with neuromuscular disorders becomes more apparent. They just can't move themselves around as well as they used to in the past. And you'll see this at around age 8 to 11. Um, and these may be really subtle declines on the graph, but it may be functionally that now a child loses the ability to transfer independently and needs a bit more assistance. So functionally, it may be fairly dramatic. Typically, surgery is best between 7 and 11 years of age. So we certainly do some younger and we certainly do some older, but that's when a child has the ability to recover well uh, and probably the ability to obtain maximal benefit. In addition, contractures at that point are usually uh, becoming not amenable to non-surgical treatments. So for the ambulatory kids, our goal is to maintain their function, maintain their ambulation, prevent contractures that may cause them difficulties, and then prevent pain. And these are, this is a very wide spectrum of children, the kids playing soccer versus the kids that need a walker to get around. We don't necessarily increase their function, but we really want to maintain what they currently have. For the kids who are more wheelchair bound, we want to make sure that their caregivers have the easiest opportunity to help them. We want to prevent pain as much as possible, make sure that care is relatively easy. So this can be done by maintaining range of motion of joints, improve sitting tolerance or balance, improve foot position for transferring. Uh, but again, we're very unlikely to improve ambulation, but we might improve standing tolerance or transfers, which can really be a big difference for the caregiver. So surgical goals are usually to improve a range of motion. So if an ankle is stuck in equinus and we lengthen a tendon, that foot may have a better range of motion, which will translate into better walking. We want to reduce pain, which sometimes is through bony alignment or improved efficiencies. And sometimes we can rebalance muscle pull. So if foot that's being pushed in a poor position can then be plantigrade. What we really can't do is make someone stronger or more coordinated or improve their balance. These are higher function neurological uh, issues that are almost impossible to correct with surgery. Some therapy can improve strength and maybe some coordination, but surgery rarely causes this. We uh, take care mainly of the spine and the lower extremities, and I do have upper extremity experts, and I'll defer to the discussion of this with them if, in the future. So most of the spine issues we deal with are neuromuscular scoliosis. The hips can slowly spastically dislocate. The knees may be stiff in extension or they may be flexed, and the ankles are oftentimes contracted, and the foot can be in almost any position you can imagine. A neuromuscular scoliosis is usually managed with a spinal fusion with implants when the children are periadolescent ages. The sur surgery goes from the base of the neck all the way to the pelvis and improves sitting balance with the goal of preventing curve progression and providing a better seating position. Bracing really does not prevent curve progression in neuromuscular curves like it does in idiopathic curves. And here you see a fairly significant curve after its fusion. 
the pelvis is nicely balanced. They're significantly more upright. Their seating position, you can imagine, is dramatically improved. And their ability to interact with the world is improved because now they're more upright rather than slumping over into their chair. They should be referred to us when you see an obvious increase in stiffness in the back. So if a child that will lean to the left and you push them in their chair and they lean to the right, that's probably okay. But once they get to the point where you can't really flex them both directions, they're becoming a bit more stiff and probably need to be evaluated. The hips in children with cerebral palsy are typically normal at birth, but abnormal muscle forces and rotational differences of the bone slowly pull the hip out of the socket. And close monitoring allows us to intervene early and have perhaps better surgical outcomes. And the likelihood of this happening is directly related to the functional ability. So a child running around has almost no risk of hip subluxation versus a child who is in a wheelchair and requires all full-time care has an 80 or 90% likelihood of hip dysplasia. Once displacement is observed, surgery is best. There's really been no proven evidence that therapy or bracing or Botox can prevent this from occurring. And post-surgically, we uh, oftentimes will operate on both sides, even if one is involved, so that the rotational differences are taken care of, the limb lengths are equalized, and in, in this post-operative case, you see how the hip is now well reduced within the acetabulum. They should come to us relatively early. There are very specific guidelines for the management and continued surveillance of hip dysplasia that almost always requires an x-ray around the age of two or their first orthopedic evaluation. Then depending upon their functional ability and what that radiograph shows, they get serial radiographs or exams depending upon their age and findings. Um, and this is most important, especially in those children who are non-ambulatory, that they be seen relatively early. The knees can contract due to a hamstring spasticity, leading to a crouched gait position, and eventually this can become very uh, taxing and very inefficient for children to get around. So sometimes early muscle releases can prevent or reduce knee contractures. And we can sometimes grow knees that are contracted out of that. So in a child who is still growing, you can see these little implants placed in the front of the growth plate of the femur. This causes the femur to deform as it grows, but by deforming, it extends the knee into a straight position, and it's beneficial. If they're skeletally mature, then a surgery can, can achieve the same result, where you take a wedge out of the femur that allows proper alignment of the lower extremity. And so taking that wedge out then allows the knee to become acutely straight. And this postoperatively demonstrates the plate that's in place and the femoral and tibial shafts in line. So now that knee is completely extended. You should be sent to us with knee pathology if there's asymmetry or if you're starting to develop contractures where either the knee doesn't flex very well or it's stuck in a flex position significantly inhibiting ambulation or sitting balance. They can have very stiff knees and what families will complain of is that they're wearing out the front of their shoes or they're tripping or dragging their toes and that may be an indication to see us. The foot and ankle can go into almost any position and when children are young, it's flexible. And when it's flexible, it can be put into a brace and made plantigrade, and that's very reasonable. Unfortunately, over time, these foot positions become more stiff, resulting in bony changes and significant decrease in tolerance of bracing. In addition, toe walking is the most common orthopedic manifestation of cerebral palsy. Almost always toe walking is due to an Achilles contracture. There are some occasions, as you see in letter C, where the knee flexion creates ankle equinus, or what we call apparent equinus, because that ankle is actually plantigrade, but it being driven into a toe walking position because the knee is flexed. That child would not benefit from Achilles tendon lengthening. You have to be careful of when you're assessing these kids. So foot deformity and ankle deformity is driven by age, the stiffness of the foot, the ambulatory potential of the child, the goal always being a flat, braceable, shoeable, flexible, and pain-free foot. And that may differ for GMFCS level. So sometimes a bony fusion is most appropriate for a child that does not stand and ambulate versus some of the soccer players need as flexible and normal as a foot as possible. And so the surgical treatments may be different. Patients should come to us with foot and ankle pathology when they're starting to have difficulties. And the difficulty may be that they've always worn a brace, and no matter what the orthotist does, the brace is no longer well tolerated. To me, that implies there's a contracture that's limiting the ability to get into a brace comfortably, and surgery may be warranted. Sometimes even just shoe wear becomes more and more difficult. And if the family notices the foot position is changing, then an evaluation is appropriate. So we attempt to provide thoughtful care for children using evidence-based guidelines. We understand every child is different with different goals, and we're very careful to know what those may be and address our goals and make sure the expectations of outcome are realistic with everyone. 
And we try and involve the family as well as all the interdisciplinary uh, members of the team in surgical decision making. So thank you very much. I'm happy to entertain any questions you might have about our cerebral palsy or movement science lab programs here.